Good morning. If you have your Bible with you, turn to Mark chapter 8, verse uh, 22 through 37 is where we'll be this morning. Let me show you what we're going to see in this scripture. There are, there is influences in our culture right now and in our world that's trying to get you to take a detour from faithfulness to following Jesus, promising that this detour that they're trying to get you to take will get you to the same destination. And what is this detour? Let's just call it the, the American dream. And I don't mean dusty roads. I mean like the pursuit of happiness under the sun here on earth. Life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The, the white picket fence. The big bank account. Stability, safety, security. Happy wife, happy life, happy kids, and everything in between. That this promise detour is not just a detour that lets you go to the same destination that you would otherwise go. But I'm going to put on the table for us today that this is not a detour of you chasing the same thing that your neighbor's chasing and somehow obtaining salvation of your souls at the end, that this is not a detour. But I would venture to tell you that this is a different road completely. And this is a different direction than the one that the Lord Jesus would want you to go in. It's, it's a different place entirely, a different destination than faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. So today in Mark chapter 8, we will look at who Jesus is and how that influences the direction of your life. Everything about you could change under the truth of these scriptures. I'm not going to undersell it like that, to say something other than that. But let us look at the identity of the Lord Jesus and the identity of the Christian. If you wouldn't mind to stand in the honor of the reading of the word of the Lord, though we're looking at Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 37, this morning we will begin, for our purposes, reading in verse 27. And, they came, uh, and, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged him to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the, scri and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would set our minds on the things that they need to be set on right now, that you would be the one who does this supernaturally. We need your help. We are at your mercy and begging for mercy. So please help us. In Jesus' name, amen. You all can be seated. Seated. 
thinking along the lines of this detour of the American dream versus the road of faithfulness to the Lord Jesus, we cannot, absolutely positively cannot, fill in the blank for ourselves with our own opinions on what it means for us to follow Jesus. To me, following Jesus means, no, no, none of us get that luxury. For what we see here in Mark chapter 8 is the Lord Jesus describing who he is and what we are to do in his own words and on his own terms. So, as we look at this, we must walk over this bridge together in verses 22 through 26. If we, uh, we talked about it last week, but we're going to relook at it for just a moment. Because 22 through 26 connects us from where we have been to where we are going today. So Jesus is dealing with, if you remember, he's dealing with the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees in the previous verses. And his followers' blindness. And Jesus intervenes in the man's blindness. So, people bring this man to him, and pe preachers, theologians, whoever they are, <laughs> refer to this man as the twice-touched blind man. Meaning that Jesus touches him, asks him, hey, how, how's, how, how do you see? And then he touches him again. And there are four movements in this story of the twice-touched blind man that go where we're going today. First, that being blindness. The man, they bring this man to Jesus. He can't see, can't see anything. Second, from blindness, there is blurriness. Jesus is, touches this man, and, and then he asks him a question, can you see anything? And then from this blurriness, there is clear sight, thirdly, and fourth, Jesus says, keep a secret. Don't tell anybody. So those four movements, we see much of that in this interaction with Peter on the way to Caesarea Philippi, beginning in verse 27. So Jesus is walking and he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? It, there's not straight blindness, but there is blurriness here because they say, ah, some people say John the Baptist, others say Jeremiah or, or, or one of the prophets. So they, Elijah, they start batting around ideas. They're not completely blind, but they are blurry at this point. They don't yet see who Jesus is clearly. So he rephrases the question beginning in verse 29, if you want to look at that with me in your Bible. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to tell anyone about him. So... Peter answers this question, and boy, does he get it right. Matthew's commentary on this is that he says in the King James, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter, is, with his flaws and all his warts that we see in the Scriptures, in this moment, he got it right. You are the Christ. That's what he says. But what does that mean? Because they're not Christ's walking around in our day. If, we, if Peter said, you are a plumber, then we could associate, like, okay, we get it. Right? Or if Peter says, if you are a king or a president or an insurance agent, like there are things that we can associate that would make sense to us. But what does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? Now, I've heard it worded like this, but do you ever get around people who are best friends and you're kind of the new kid in town? Kind of, they're closer to each other and you're, you're kind of new, so they start talking and they may tell half of a joke. Right? They may just say like a few, a tagline, and everybody busts out laughing about how funny that is. But you're not really connected like they're connected, so you're like, <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. I have no clue. 
right? Because it could be one of those moments. They have all this history together that you don't have with them. And maybe it was one of those, you had to be there moments and they were all there, but you weren't there. So you just kind of wait till the laughing dies down and hope they talk about something else other than that. That's what you do. Now, the issue is, is that this announcement by Peter in Mark 8 could be a lot like that for us, that we just don't get it. You had to be there. We weren't there uh, with this term Christ because it doesn't really connect to us. Like even in the church, if, if you know, if you speak church in ease, then it might mean something, but it might not impact you deeply to say that Jesus is the Christ, and maybe you were like five-year-old little Robbie who thought it was Joseph Christ and Mary Christ, and they had a little boy, and his name was Jesus Christ. That's not really how that worked anyway, as we've talked about before. Uh, but Christ is not a last name. It's a title. And back in that day, they didn't have last names. Jesus' real last name would have been Jesus bar Joseph, it would be Jesus son of Joseph is how his next door neighbor would have referred to him. Because they didn't have, in that culture, they did not take, have last names. They took their daddy's first name as the, what came after their first name, right? So Jesus is called the Christ here. Now, if, if from an Old Testament perspective, this inside joke that we might be outsiders on is that it was God's promised anointed one. So Israel didn't crown a king necessarily. What they did was they anointed a king. That's what they did. So in the Old Testament, there are three offices in which that they anointed someone, prophet, priest, king. That's what they, they were. So anyone in the Old Testament who was a prophet, priest, or king kind of was a Messiah because that means anointed one. That, that person was set aside for a special task. So, but they had those three offices of prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament. And yet, if you study the Old Testament, you see that each one of those three offices in the scriptures had earthly people who filled those offices. But each office of pro prophet, priest, and king said there's going to be one coming who fulfills this in an eternal way? Does that make sense? I'll give you an example. You can just write these down, look them up later. Deuteronomy 18. There is a prophet coming that would be like Moses. Psalm 110.9. There was, would be a priest coming in the order after Melchizedek. He would be priest forever. Then Jeremiah 25. There would be a king coming after the line of David. So each office said, yes, men may fill these things, but there is going to be one who fills this thing in a way that we have never dreamed of or imagined. Zechariah 6, 9, you can write that down, look it up later, but he see, the prophet sees a vision in which there's a priest who sits on a king's throne. So in the days before this, they had... The idea that these offices would overlap. So, the Lord Jesus is this coming one. So, needless to say, what Mark has delivered for us with this great confession, that's what they call it, what Peter says here is that Jesus is the one of whom all their hopes and dreams are hung on. He is the coming one who fills all of these offices in an everlasting, eternal way. So this is weighty. This is magnificent. So we need to think long and hard about what it means that the Lord Jesus is the Christ. Because Peter's using that word, but here in a minute, he's going to show us that he doesn't necessarily understand what that word means. 
Okay, so we can use that word. Peter's proof positive that we can use that word and not really understand what that word means. So we approach this passage and as we look at these scriptures, they split just like a curtain into two parts. We see who Jesus really is and what he really requires of his followers. First, who he is. So because Jesus is the promised one uh, sent by God, he will arise from suffering. He will arise from suffering. Look at verse 31 with me in your Bible. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So upon Peter's confession here in this moment, this became the theme of everything Jesus did after this moment. So what happens in the book of Mark is that we have ascended to the climax, to the mountaintop here, and everything after this flows from this. This is it for us. So what does Jesus say? He began, right? So this moment he started to keep saying that the Son of Man must suffer many things. As we've talked about before, this is from Daniel 13, 7, 13, in which that one in human form is there with the Ancient of Days in Daniel, and he receives an eternal kingdom. So what's that mean? Is that one's going to look like us and rule forever. That's what the Son of Man is. So this one who looks like us, who rules forever, what's going to happen to him? He is going to suffer many things. He's going to suffer many things. He's not going to have a welcome reception. And he's going to be rejected there in the verse by elders, chief priests, and scribes. So the one who is God, but looks like us, who has received an everlasting kingdom, comes down to us and he will suffer and be rejected by Israel. The people, the religious people that should have accepted him, will reject him. And not only will he suffer, but he's going to die. He's going to die. The eternal God who created everything wrapped himself in skin in the person of the Lord Jesus and walked among us, and he will be rejected by us. They will execute him, putting him to death on a cross. And after three days, rise again. That's what Jesus began to tell his followers at this point. That was scandalous, but it wouldn't be new. It was scandalous, but it wouldn't be new. Jews to this day still don't know what to do with Isaiah 53, 700 years prior at least, to Mark chapter 8, right? We read Isaiah 53 like it's just a commentary that was later added. But no, it was a foreshadowing that was told in advance. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So here's what's happening. This son of man in Daniel 7 is wrapping his, his, him in skin, coming. Everyone's hopes and dreams is hung upon him. And he is going to suffer, die, and rise. But this, this doesn't sound right to us. You know, because if, if I, there, there's tension here, and Peter's going to release that tension by saying something ignorant. It makes me feel good that I'm not the only one who relieves tension by saying something ignorant. That there is someone else who does that. <laughs> I'd rather say something silly than for it to be quiet. You know what I mean? And that is what Peter does. 
But there's this tension here in the verse. Because you know how I would have wrote, written this story? I've, seen, I've watched way too much TV. I, I, would, I would, would have written it like a Liam Neeson or a Rambo movie in which that he comes in with zero help, takes them on his, himself, and obliterates everyone. He's the last one standing. In fact, I critique the last Liam Neeson movie because he's kind of getting up there now and he just got kicked around the entire time. And I was like, where's the guy from Taken? You know, like he, he goes and takes anything he wants, takes everybody he wants. But now he's kind of getting some mileage on him and he's just, this old man gets beat up. We're like, that ain't, that, that ain't right. Well, we look at this and we go, the Son of Man is here to whom the Ancient of Days has given everything to and he's just going to get beat? He's going to get mocked? He's going to get spit on? Publicly shamed? This, no, that surely not, right? That doesn't... Like if you were raised by strict parents, you're like, He's God, and He's good, and He's holy, and He comes, and He never did anything wrong. You know who should have been beaten, mocked, and scourged? Sinners. Sinners. Sinners should have been the ones rejected, ridiculed, and rebuked. That's what should have happened. So there's the shameful element that the Son of Man would come and He'd suffer many things. There's this shameful element around the Gospel. And Paul addresses it in Romans 1. He says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of this. Here at the end of this passage that we're looking at in Mark 8, Jesus gives this warning and he says, Who's ever, whoever is ashamed of my words, will I be ashamed of when I come in, in the glory of the Father, surrounded by holy angels, here in just a second. We're going to get there. But there's, there's the shame inherent that, that it's not right. The world is not right when God comes and he's treated like this by us. The world is not right like that. You know who should have got what they deserved? Us. That's who should have gotten beaten. That's who should have gotten in trouble. The one who did the wrong thing. Not the one who never did anything wrong. Do you feel this outrage that the sinless Lamb of God would be slain for sinners? That doesn't seem right. It's not right, is it? It can't be, can it? You know, Peter popped that pressure with saying something ignorant. He just, he just did it. He said, surely, Lord, will this, this is not, no, 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 no. This will never happen to you. This is never going to happen. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him in verse 32. Jesus, let me just, let me just set this right. Brother, I mean, you, are, you have done nothing to deserve the fate of murder. Like, you, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything wrong. So he rebukes Jesus. Because by his estimation and keeping score, that's not right. It's not what's supposed to happen. Well, in the verse, verse 33, let's look at it. It says, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. 
Jesus understands if Peter doesn't understand. That's what he does, right? Like up until this point, Peter could have went home and told his wife, Honey, listen, we were on the road to Caesarea Philippi and Jesus was quizzing us and he asked us this really big question and he said, Who do people say I was? And I knew who people said he was, so I told him what people said he, who he was. And then he said, Who do you say I am? And then here it was, honey, just listen. I said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. best day of my entire life and that conversation never happened ever between Peter and his wife you know how you know that or if he did he just kind of left is like that was it (laughs) because he left this little detail out to where he was rebuking the Lord Jesus and Jesus starts to rebuke him and in so many words let's put this in our modern tongue he said step back you devil how's that for a pope (laughs) how's that for the 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 catholic church believes that this was the, the the infallible perfect first pope and here's jesus going hey you're a devil get back oops got the wrong guy didn't they now What is happening here is that Jesus rebukes Peter. And it says, it's interesting how he words this, he's turning and seeing his disciples. Because the issue is is that this this is bad that Peter's saying, but this is the leaven, right, that's of the Pharisees and Herod that's going to spread. So here's what Jesus does. He stops the spread of the leaven. Seeing his disciples, he rebukes Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. So why does he call Peter Satan? Because that's what his breath smells like, the devil. Here's what I mean by that, is that there was a day in the beginning of the Gospels when Jesus went aside to be tempted by the devil, and he said, if you come over here, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these things. If you throw yourself down and let the angels cushion your fall, all of this will be yours. So Jesus, in the beginning of the gospel, was already tempted to not suffer, to have no suffering. He was already tempted with this easier road by Satan, to which the Lord Jesus rebuked Satan, Now he rebukes Peter for trying to tempt him away from the cross, just like this. So what's Peter doing? He's probably well-intentioned. He doesn't want bad things to happen to the Lord Jesus. He doesn't. He wants him to be comfortable, happy, and in control of everything in a way that is pleasing to outsiders by his standards. That's what he's, he's wanting. Now, the, here's the idea. Is the Messiah suffering. Nobody knew what to do with Isaiah 53 all the way until they saw Isaiah 53 lived out in front of them. So what Jesus was supposed to do by public opinion in that day was come and free them from Roman oppression. He was supposed to come like Rambo or a younger Liam Neeson and take everybody out, establish the kingdom and rule of David, the throne of David, unhindered by Rome without any suffering so when Jesus comes and does this it goes completely against the plan of God you see the story that God wrote in history he is the one who writes every story and the way that he wrote this story 
of how things really went is the Messiah that goes against every natural inclination that we have. It goes completely against it. There can be no, and here's the why behind that. There can be no salvation without suffering. There cannot be any salvation without death because the wages of sin is death. You see that? Because what happened to Adam and Eve in the beginning of Genesis, it wasn't that God told them that once you sin, bad things are going to happen to you. No, he said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So there is the connection between sin and death. From before the very first sin ever was sinned. There was the promise of death. So for the Lord Jesus to not suffer and die is for us to stay in our sins. For one of us has to die because the promise of death still reigns for the sinner. And we struggle with this, right? Because we take the holiness of God so lightly and we think sin is light. And we don't re- it's not really that bad what we do, right? It's not... Guilt is a thing that we avoid. Un- guilt, excuse me, when I'm uncomfortable, I do something about it. That thermostat has buttons on it. And when the moment it gets a degree that I don't like it to be, I go, I push a button, and it's fixed. Like we desire our own comfort. Well, here's how bad our sin is, is that the Lord Jesus, God himself came to deal with it, to die on the cross. And he took it all upon himself, dying instead of the deserving sinners. And if we turn from our sin and trust in Him, He will forgive us of our sin and save us. Now, there is no salvation for you without the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus. The Son of Man must suffer many things. He has to do that for Him to be God's chosen Messiah. He will not take a detour like Peter's trying to get. Surely not, God, the Lord, that this is going to happen to you. Surely not. From the context of the verse, the things of God are suffering for the Lord Jesus. The things of man is avoiding that suffering. So, because Jesus is the promised one sent by God, he will arise from suffering. And if we follow him, we will arrive from the same road. We will arrive from the same road. What he's doing here is clarifying for us what it means, right? So it's not just Jesus suffers, dies, rises, and your life could look completely different from his. No. He's saying that that colors everything that we are and everything that we do. Look at verse 34. As he calls the crowd and disciples to him, here's what he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here's what happens in this clarification of the Lord Jesus. He's telling us the qualifications or the conditions for being a Christian, for being one of his followers. It means more than identifying ourselves with him or being able to check the box on a census form. It means more than that. It means action. And these are the conditions for being a Christian. This is what you do. Have you ever seen one of those commercials? And, and nowadays, they just like speed it up at the end. So who knows what they really say? But what they, <laughs> there's, they're selling something or wanting you to see something. And at the end, it's void if prohibited. Blackouts do apply, not available in all areas. What? We don't know what it says. We don't really pay any attention to it. But here's here's what it means. If we don't come through for you, or if we don't deliver as promised, you can't blame us. We can't be in trouble if we promise you something and don't follow through on it. That's the terms and conditions. So 
let me tell you something about terms and conditions that you check and you look at. It basically says they own you if something goes wrong and you can't do anything about it. Click to agree and get on with your life. That's what it means. I'm buying this. What does the, the little fine print say? It says it's yours and you, if you take it back, we're going to come out on the, <laughs> a winner every time as a company. That's what it means. Now, there is not fine print in the Christian life. Jesus comes up in verse 34 because there seems to be a little misconception on what it means that he is the Christ to people who are currently following him, people who are thinking about following him, right? There's the disciples and the crowd here in this verse. And he says, if anyone would come after me. So here's what that means. Anyone, anyone, or everyone who comes after him. There are no exceptions to these conditions of following him. And that's why I started this with the American dream is, a, is not just a detour that gets us to the same destination. It's a completely different road in a completely different direction than the Christian life. It's not the same. It may promise the fulfillment at the end, but it does not deliver. It's different. It's completely different. Because of these first two words that on the screen as part of verse 34, if anyone would come. So everyone who does come has to do this. And I'm not saying you do this and that makes you a Christian. No. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Salvation is solely by grace. I'm not saying you deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Him, and then at the end you get the certificate that says, hey, you're a Christian because you've done these things. But you had a white belt and now you have a black Christian karate belt. No, this isn't earning your belt. You're, you're saved because you had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Salvation by grace through faith forever. That's what it is. This isn't works righteousness. What Jesus is saying is this is what genuine Christianity looks like in the life of someone who has repented and believed. That's what genuine Christianity looks like. Following the Lord Jesus, right? Because we're wearing the name on our jersey. On the back of your jersey is the, the, is the name Christian. Not your own name, his name. We are of Christ, little Christs. Acts chapter 11, they were first called Christians at Antioch. And ever since, so have we. Now, so here it, it, it means action. This means action. So if anyone, so everyone, all who follow, no exceptions. Oh, okay, so this is the uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. This is like the other country, Christianity. But can, can we just go to the American one? Can, can we just do that one? You know, like the more comfortable um, Christianity light. Facebook has this little app and it takes less room up on your phone and it... it, it it's boiled down. It's simpler. It's called Facebook Lite. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you can download it and, and it doesn't take all, it doesn't do all the things that Facebook does. And it's just like a little version of it. And it's not really the, the, the whole thing, but it's just more convenient for you. You see, we've done that with Christianity. There's like Christianity and then there's this American Christianity Lite, which it doesn't take as much time for and it's simpler and it's easier and it's not as time consuming here's the problem there is nothing like that that is real that is a lie because the the, the invitation here in verse 34 is to anyone who comes to everyone who does come 
This is what it's like to be a Christian. Well, what do they do? First, they deny themselves. Game over for most of us, right? Because we like ourselves. Following Jesus means that you can't come after him and get everything you want in your life. But we've made this easier. We've made this simpler. You can do this in four easy payments of $19.99. Void if prohibited, blackout still apply, not available in our areas. You know, all that stuff, right? No. To follow Jesus means to deny you. To deny you. It means self-denial. That we have waived the rights of self-determination. That we have waived our agenda for His agenda. That's what we've done. If anyone would come after me, here's what they do. They deny themselves. That's what they do. You can not be his disciple and carry out the agenda of another master. For a man cannot serve two masters. He will either love one or hate the other. If you come after Jesus, you'll deny yourself. So there's self-denial the taking up of the cross. So how far does this self-denial go? Like, I mean, how far is this going to take us? Well, you're going to take up your cross. You put to death your self-centeredness and being in charge of your own life, your own direction, your own decisions. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran minister who opposed Adolf Hitler in World War II. I don't agree with everything he ever said, but I agree with this. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. He bids him to come and die. That is what he's calling you to do, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and come after him. That's what it is. It's not denial for denial's sake. It's a coming after, a denying of you, a crucifying of your desire, and a following of Him. Verse 35 gives us why this Why we should do this. Because think about it. Here's what I'm telling you. I'm saying, come after Him. Get rid of you. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Him. I'm selling you something that nobody wants to buy. Nobody in their right mind would waive their right for self-determination. It's like, we're like, salvation is is here at the altar and let's put barbed wire up so nobody gets here because we want want them to bleed before they come. Why would anybody ever try to do that? Because of this in verse 35. Because he's worthy. He's worthy of this. And you could live for lesser things. You could live for yourself. You could do what you want to do, but in the end, it will not be worth it to you. It will be hard. You will have bad days. You will suffer for Him. And why would anyone do that? Why would you ever do that? Verse 35, For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Because there is a way of living in which that you are trying to save your life, to do what, to keep it safe, to make it long. We want to live longer, we want to live safer. You trying to save your life, control your life, making it do what you want to do. Right? The whole Dave Ramsey plan with money we try to do on your life. Don't ask your money where it went. Tell it where to go. That's what Dave says about what to do with your money. Right? So apply that to this situation. Don't 
Ask your life where it's going. Tell your life where it to go, where you want it to go. That's how you obtain wealth in your life. Control it. Save it. Keep it. Control it. But no, here's the truth for that in verse 35. If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. There is a losing war of you controlling your life. It's grasping fists full of air. That's what it is. But Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. There's only one way out of this thing. And it's you losing your life, you giving it away for Jesus' sake and the spread of the Gospel. So look at the scrutiny that this passage places on your life. Look at your life. Are you, does it look like one that you're trying to save and control? Or does it look like you're trying to give that bad boy away? Because what he's saying here in verse 35 is the only way to save that thing is to spread it. To give it away. This is weird. It's weird in our culture. As one pr- preacher said, if, so- if something I'm saying to you sounds really normal into the world outside, guarantee it's a lie. But if it sounds countercultural, completely different, no. This is the truth weird in our culture. Because why would you try to give your life away when you could save it? Well, Because saving your life is a losing effort. It's a losing effort. That's what Jesus is is saying here. There's only two categories. Either wasting our life by saving it, spending our life to save it. Now, you watch out for you and yours. You make strong financial decisions always that benefit you. You do all that kind of stuff. You get your ducks in a row. Your house looks like Pinterest. Your bank account looks like interest. You've got all of that going on for you. Everything's in place. Your life is managed. Your life is safe. You will lose it. You will lose it that way. That is the way to a lost life. A stingy life is a lost life. Now, you make those decisions, you climb the ladder as high as you can go. Your decisions are based on the here and now, the smart and the wise, according to the age. It it sounds right. And it's wrong. Because there is this obedience that Jesus is calling us to here in this passage. Because this looks like madness to a watching world. This looks like madness to the watching world. To give your life away. To spend it and be spent for souls. That's what this looks like. Everybody's out there is trying to gain by worldly standards, and here you are going completely against the grain. It's like you're living for a different world, a world that is to come. Jesus asked the question, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And for what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So what happens if you chase after everything that you're now maybe possibly pursuing that everyone else in this world is also looking for too? What happens if you get it? Well, you would lose your soul. You would lose your soul. If you gain the whole world just to lose your soul, what would you really gain? What do you really have? But the ability to take care of your loved ones, to get a really nice oak casket, maybe mahogany, to do that, then to forever be the fuel for flames. 
you wouldn't gain anything like that. Is, is that worth it to you? Let me ask you a question, weird question. What if I offered you $1,000 for your right eye? Would, would you take it, right? I give you $1,000, you give me your right eye. No, no. Silly. Okay, counter offer on the table. $10,000 for your right eye. Uh, you got two of them, just to be clear. No, that's still no. $100 million for your right eye. Would you take it and give it for that? You might be thinking about it, right? Because after all, you got two of them. Here's why you might not do that. It is part of you. It's a part of you. A precious part of you. So there's not a price that somebody might want to put on that thing. What if I told you that there is a part of you that will live forever that is far more precious than your eye and worth far more than any amount of money could ever buy that is your soul? That there is a part of you that will live forever in heaven or in the presence of God, to be more accurate, or hell. And there is a negotiation right now on the table for you, right? If you watch TV, you're being negotiated with. If you talk to friends, you're being negotiated with. For you to gain the world. To live your best life in this life. You're being negotiated with to do that. But what this verse shows us that there's a deadening of inside of you that happens with that negotiation that you could gain the whole world and inside of you would lose your soul to the flames. It's not worth it, is it? Why would we suffer when we could be comfortable? Well, because we cannot make a trade for our souls. And everything comes down to this in verse 38. Jesus tells them why He's taking the suffering road and why everyone else should take that same road. Why, if you're doing this life right, you will be doing this life hard. And there will be suffering for you. If anyone desires to live a godly life, there will be suffering. Paul told Timothy that because everything comes down to this moment in verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. All the people who live today, that's the generation here, the generation that Mark was in. It was a sinful and adulterous generation. We live in a sinful and adulterous generation. Jesus said, if the gospel of a suffering servant king makes you feel shame, in which that you duck back in shame of this gospel of the holy God wrapped in skin, dead by sinners, taking on our sin and raised on the third day, if you are ashamed of him, there is a day in which that he will, all of his glory will be on display. There will be no shame on that day. He will come in the glory of His Father surrounded by holy angels. There will be no negotiation on that day. There is a day in which that if you are ashamed of Him, He will be ashamed of you on that day. So the question that we have to answer based on thir verse 38 is what will your reception be by the Lord Jesus when He comes in all His glory? Because everything comes down to this, that He will come in His glory and you will see Him. And 
If you're not a Christian, what does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? It means that you need to turn from your sin and trust in Him. What does trusting in Him look like out in your life? We'll just go back to verse 31 and keep going again. I would encourage you, if you are a Christian, to look at the road that the Lord Jesus took, the suffering, the devil, Peter tried to get him to turn aside and he would not. I would venture to say that we should not turn aside from suffering in following the Lord Jesus. And and now let me be clear. There is suffering that you will take because you're here. Because you're in this world. A crying baby in a newborn unit suffers cold and hunger and they cry. They are dealing with suffering. Mainly because they're young and they think everybody's trying to kill them an hour after they've eaten. There is suffering that happens there. And there is cancer. And there is murder. In which that you might not have a lot of control of that suffering. But we're talking about, for the Christians in this room, we're talking about suffering because you're following Jesus. If anyone comes after me, there's a cross for me and there's a cross for him to take. Is what Jesus is saying here. You're taking up your cross and following Him. Jesus suffered in His life and death, and anyone who truly follows Him will suffer in His life. There are decisions that we make that we don't always win in. That's what this looks like. And that is what we're calling, He's calling us all to do. That's what faithfulness looks like. You may suffer with cancer. You may suffer with murder. Those are things that happen. Terrible things that happen. We're talking about voluntary, in many cases, voluntary suffering on behalf of the Lord Jesus. You want to get a quick taste of this, share the gospel with an unbeliever. And get that reception from them. That is the call of the Christian to voluntarily take up the cross because the Christ is worthy. One day you will see Him in in His glory and there will either be shame on that day or rejoicing forevermore in His presence. That is what everything we are living and doing comes down to this moment and the face of the Lord Jesus and the expression on that face. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Son. We ask that You would preach in our hearts the glory of God in the face of Christ, this Jesus who took a suffering road, and he, be- he beckons us to do the same. So we ask that you would change our hearts, that you would apply this truth to us. We need you. We are desperate for you. We desperately worship our own comfort, and we ask that you would allow us by your grace to repent to doing other than that. We want to be faithful in the following of the Lord Jesus. So please help us focus our eyes when we're focused on the wrong things, when the culture tries to get us to detour from the suffering road that the Lord Jesus takes. Expose those lies in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.